Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Carrie, spelled like the Stephen King novel. This video is the result of my deep dive into US history of the 1890s during and after making my 1890s historical costume. It is a bit of a horror movie, in part because negative events sell more newspapers and stick in our collective memories more so than positive ones, but I'll throw some relatively not terrible historical moments in there with the bad and the really, really awful. Why am I doing this? Well. Have you noticed the push by state lawmakers across America to suppress the teaching of the more difficult aspects of American history, the fear-mongering around critical race theory, and the banning of books related to heavy topics like enslavement and its legacy of systemic racism in US society, all to prevent students from feeling uncomfortable and succumbing to the woke agenda, which, I don't know, ends up being equality, social and environmental justice? Well, that. I'm all for social justice. If you are interested in learning a more nuanced version of American history than the mythical American dream and American exceptionalism, then this video is for you. If all you want to hear are the positives of our past, you should probably watch this anyway because discomfort can lead to learning and greater empathy. All of this sums up to a major point I want to make with this video that despite my enjoyment of making and wearing historical costumes, I do not in any way think I was born in the wrong era or wish I had lived back then. The advances in equality and medicine alone are enough to make me glad I live in the here and now, despite the crap going on in 2022. Content warning, I will be talking about racial violence of the 1890s in this video. In discussing this history, my intention is not to make viewers feel guilty or down on America, but rather to engender greater empathy for marginalized people and motivation to work towards social justice. Well, with that cheerful introduction, let's get started. First off, many of our grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-great-great-great, etc. grandparents were born or got together in the 1890s, allowing their descendants to be here today. <laughs> President Benjamin Harrison appointed Alice B. Singer as his presidential secretary on January 2nd, 1890. She was the first female White House staffer, and apparently knew more about Harrison's personal and official affairs than even he did. Which, given the importance of administrative assistance where I work, I can definitely believe. On October 1st, 1890, Congress authorized the formation of Yosemite National Park in and around the gorgeous glacial U-shaped valley in the Sierra Nevada mountains of Eastern California. Landscape features like Half Dome, a granite exfoliation dome cut by glacial erosion, and Bridal Veil Falls in a hanging valley are recognizable even to those who have not visited the park. The beautiful landscape and its preservation by the U.S. came at a disgraceful price, however. The Miwok, a First Nations or Native American people in California, and other Native groups had lived in the region for upwards of 4,000 years and were largely driven out or killed prior to the creation of the park. Those that remained in 1890 were allowed to stay and contribute to the tourist trade, but their lives and livelihoods were forever altered or destroyed. They were slowly pushed out during the 20th century, and no indigenous communities live inside the park today. They called the valley Awani, or Big Mouth, then Yosemite, or Killer. The Miwok in the region call themselves the Awanichi. John Muir, who spearheaded the effort to get Yosemite Park Legalized, founded the Sierra Club in 1892, which started by working to preserve areas in the Sierra Nevada mountains, but eventually spread throughout the country. Today, the Sierra Club acknowledges the racist ideas and actions of their founder and early members, and in the many years since, in which the club's actions often favored the needs and desires of white people over people of color, particularly First Nations people. Muir and some of his associates were also involved in and even led the early eugenics movement in the U.S. I'm glad the current Sierra Club leadership is engaged in truth-telling, centering voices left out of conservation discussions, and attempting to repair the immense harm done. We'll see how far they get. U.S. suffragists formed the National American Women's Suffrage Association in February 1890 with Elizabeth Cady Stanton as president. The U.S. Senate roundly defeated a proposed women's suffrage amendment in 1890, so the two rival suffrage groups, the American Women's Suffrage Association, led by Lucy Stone, and the National 
National Women's Suffrage Association, led by Canton and Susan B. Anthony, joined forces in order to push forward on women's right to vote state by state and eventually with a constitutional amendment. The 15th Amendment had given freed black men the right to vote in 1870 when it was ratified, but explicitly left out women. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Suffragists like Lucy Stone, who were also staunch abolitionists, applauded the amendment, but there were some prominent white women like Stanton who essentially argued that white women should get the vote before black men. At her 1869 address on the 15th Amendment at the American Equal Rights Association convention, she said, think of Patrick and Sambo and Hans and Young Tongue who do not know the difference between a monarchy and a republic, who cannot read the Declaration of Independence or Webster's spelling book, making laws for Susan B. Anthony. The amendment creates an antagonism everywhere between educated, refined women and the lower orders of men, especially in the South. At an 1890 suffrage convention in Atlanta, Susan B. Anthony asked Frederick Douglass to refrain from appearing on stage with white women because that would be inappropriate. <laughs> Stanton and Anthony were leaders in the women's suffrage movement, and their perpetuation of racist ideas essentially split it, dividing the voices and power of those seeking inequality, and they made only slow progress for decades after the 15th Amendment was passed. However, when Wyoming and Idaho became states in 1890, and other western states later in the decade, their constitutions granted full women's suffrage. This push for women's suffrage as a whole encapsulated first wave feminism, which unfortunately left out black women. But of course, the 15th Amendment did not sweep away the inequalities of the past and Jim Crow laws sprang up in retaliation, particularly in the former Confederate states. In 1890, Mississippi was the first state to require a literacy test as a qualification for voting. Poor, uneducated whites were grandfathered in with a clause that enabled previously free people who voted in the state prior to 1866 to forego the test and keep on voting. Other states soon followed with these laws that disenfranchised the black male vote. 1890 also saw the publication of Jacob Rees' How the Other Half Lives, studies among the tenements of New York, which included line drawings and reproductions of his photographs of people in New York City slums taken in the 1880s. Rees was among the first Americans to use flash photography, and he did so at night on Manhattan's Lower East Side to document poverty, crime, desperation, and homelessness, and expose these elements to the upper classes with the hope of inspiring empathy and change. Rees followed up this book with a sequel in 1892 entitled Children of the Poor. To close out the first year of the last decade of the 19th century, I'm going to discuss one of the most horrific atrocities in a long line of such events in relations between First Nations people and whites in the United States, the massacre at Wounded Knee. The Lakota and other indigenous peoples of the American Plains had for decades been suffering from culture and language loss, forced assimilation, stolen land, extermination efforts, forced relocation, poverty, disease, and broken treaties and promises on the part of white colonizers. They were feeling restless, desperate, and searching for hope, which came in the form of a new religious practice from the Paiute prophet Wavoka. They called it the ghost dance. Wavoka had a vision that the Christian Messiah, Jesus Christ, had returned to earth as a Native American, and all of those who participated in the ghost dance would make it through to a time when the white people would be gone, the bison would return, and the plains would be as they had been before the white settlers arrived. I I can't blame them for feeling better when envisioning such a future, given how much suffering they had been forced to endure. White settlers and Indian police who observed the vigorous and spreading ghost dance practiced by Plains tribes became alarmed at the possibility of an impending attack, a response born out of racist fear. They did not understand or empathize with the religious practice and wanted the Plains tribes to remain quiet and quelled. To force them into submission, the U.S. officials decided to arrest the chiefs involved and get them to calm down their people. On December 15, 1890, 40 Indian police went to Standing Rock in the Dakotas to arrest Teton Lakota Chief Sitting Bull. 
He refused to go with them, and a firefight ensued in which the 59-year-old chief was shot and killed. Many of his people fled to join Lakota Sioux Chief Spotted Elk at the Cheyenne River Reservation in South Dakota. The government's plan had failed, of course, and people were still practicing the ghost dance. They were also wearing ghost dance shirts seen in a vision by Lakota religious leader Black Elk and misinterpreted as being bulletproof by others. This increased white alarm, and the decision was made to try and disarm the Lakota people. General Nelson Miles sent this telegram from South Dakota to Washington, D.C. on December 19th. The difficult Indian problem cannot be solved permanently at this end of the line. It requires the fulfillment of Congress of the treaty obligations that the Indians were entreated and coerced into signing. They signed away a valuable portion of their reservation, and it is now occupied by white people, for which they have received nothing. The dissatisfaction is widespread, especially among the Sioux, while the Cheyennes have been on the verge of starvation and were forced to commit depredations to sustain life. These facts are beyond question, and the evidence is positive and sustained by thousands of witnesses. On December 23rd, despite being ill with pneumonia, Spotted Elk and his people left their reservation to travel to the Pine Ridge Reservation and join up with Chief Red Cloud, but were met by a 7th Cavalry detachment and escorted towards the Pine Ridge Indian Agency. The Lakota were told to make camp along the Wounded Knee Creek, and later that evening, Colonel James W. Forsyth and the rest of the 7th Cavalry arrived and surrounded the encampment, setting up four Hotchkiss-designed mountain guns. There were about 500 troopers and 350 Lakota, 120 of whom were women and children. At daybreak, Colonel Forsyth commanded soldiers to confiscate weapons and move the Lakota to awaiting trains. Understandably, some of the younger Lakota men were agitated over having their rifles taken, heightening the tension of the soldiers. Accounts vary as to how the shooting began, one being that a deaf Lakota, Black Coyote, did not understand the order and refused to give up his rifle. When he was grabbed by two soldiers from behind, his rifle discharged and some of the younger Lakota brought out rifles they had concealed and started shooting at the troopers who began shooting back. Other Lakota grabbed rifles from the piles of confiscated arms, and the soldiers started using the Hotchkiss guns, shooting indiscriminately. Survivor Wasumaza, one of Spotted Elk's warriors, recalled Black Coyote was unable to hear. If they had left him alone and he was going to put his gun down where he should. They grabbed him and spinned him in the east direction. He was still unconcerned even then. He hadn't his gun pointed at anyone. His intention was to put that gun down. Right after they spun him around, there was the report of a gun, which was quite loud. I couldn't say that anyone was shot, but following that was a crash. According to Commanding General Nelson A. Miles, a scuffle occurred between one deaf warrior who had a rifle in his hand and two soldiers. The rifle was discharged and a battle occurred. Not only the warriors, but the sick chief Spotted Elk and a large number of women and children who tried to escape by running and scattering over the prairie were hunted down and killed. Miles later visited the snow-covered site and was horrified to observe women and children cut down two miles from the encampment. When the shooting stopped, 150 to 250 of the 350 Lakota people were dead, including 64-year-old Spotted Elk and Black Coyote, and 51 were wounded. The cavalry forced the wounded onto wagons for transport to Pine Ridge and left the dead because of an incoming blizzard. Later, journalists posed frozen bodies of Lakota people, including Chief Spotted Elk, in order to take pictures of them for their newspapers. I find these photographs horrific and disrespectful. Black Elk later said, I did not know then how much was ended. When I look back now from his, this high hill of my old age, I can still see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered all along the crooked gulch, as plain as when I saw them with eyes still young. And I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream. The Wounded Knee Massacre effectively ended Native people's organized armed resistance to white settlers in the West. I don't remember learning about this massacre in any of my grade school history classes, but now that I've researched it, I will never forget it, and I think December 29th should be a National Day of Remembrance and Mourning. On a happier note, 31-year-old Canadian grad student James Naismith invented basketball in late 1891, a game that has had a huge impact on many Americans. Naismith came up with the idea while trying to occupy his physical education students at the YMCA training school, now Springfield College, in Springfield, Massachusetts. As a teacher, I can totally relate. Dude, it's even harder now that they all have smartphones. Anyway, Naismith used two half-bushel peach baskets as goals, hence the 
the name of the game and a soccer ball. Those first players were quite enthusiastic and news spread quickly about the new game, leading other physical educators to ask Naismith for a list of the rules. He published them in the campus newspaper soon after and the game spread from there. And hey, a bunch of new people were becoming Americans and I'm sure many of their descendants are basketball fans today. The Ellis Island Immigration Station opened on January 1st, 1892 in New York Harbor to help manage the increasing influx of immigrants. Ellis Island officials processed 700 people on its first day in 1892 and almost 450,000 in the first year of its operation. An Irish teenager named Annie Moore was the first to emigrate to the U.S. through Ellis Island. Immigrants arrived on large boats segregated by class. Wealthy and healthy first-class passengers did not go through the station and were ushered right on in to the U.S. Less wealthy immigrants sometimes waited for days for small ferries to take them from the ship to the Ellis Island station to be processed, which sounds like going through a factory to finally become a canned good. Given the crowded tenements of New York, it's an accurate analogy. They went through very fast medical exams, and individuals deemed unhealthy were pulled aside for closer inspection. Then they wound through the Great Hall, awaiting their turn to answer 29 questions to make sure they were who they claimed to be. Most people passed through with ease, but some were stuck on the island for weeks while health and legal issues were sorted out. Some of these individuals were deported when deemed unworthy of entry, an estimated 2% of the 12 million processed at the station. Approximately 40% of Americans today are descended from immigrants who passed through Ellis Island, which closed in 1954. But not everyone was welcome. In 1892, the Thomas J. Geary Act extended the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act for another 10 years, banning Chinese immigrants for the rest of the 19th century. Also in 1892, the Citizens Committee of New Orleans, a civil rights group made up of African Americans, whites, and Creoles, convinced one of its members, Homer Plessy, to test the constitutionality of the racist Louisiana law on separate train cars. The Separate Car Act was the origin of the phrase separate but equal, which of course was not the reality. Mr. Plessy was one-eighth black and had fairly light skin. He bought a first-class train ticket and was asked by the conductor about his race. He explained his biracial status and was told to go to the coloreds only car. He refused and was arrested. Judge John H. Ferguson ruled against Plessy in Louisiana and the Citizens Committee helped Plessy appeal the case all the way to the Supreme Court. In 1896, the justices ruled against Plessy 7 to 1, stating the Louisiana law did not violate the 13th or 14th Amendments, the latter of which, according to them, was not intended to prevent social or other types of discrimination. The majority opinion by the Supreme Court essentially legitimized segregation laws and racial discrimination by private citizens and businesses. Justice John Marshall Harlan of Kentucky was the only justice who dissented the 1896 decision. His dissent reads in part, I am of the opinion that the statute of Louisiana is inconsistent with the personal liberties of citizens, white and black, in that state, and hostile to both the spirit and the letter of the Constitution of the United States. If laws of like character should be enacted in the several states of the Union, the effect would be, in the highest degree, mischievous. Slavery as an institution tolerated by law would, it is true, have disappeared from our country, but there would remain a power in the states by sinister legislation to interfere with the blessings of freedom, to regulate civil rights common to all citizens upon the basis of race, and to place in a condition of legal inferiority a large body of American citizens now constituting a part of the political community called the people of the United States, for whom and by whom, through representatives, our government is administrated. The following uptick in Jim Crow laws sustained Harlan's warning. In 1893, Lizzie Borden was acquitted of the murders of her stepmother Abby and father Andrew, who had been killed with a hatchet. Her parents' heads had been removed during the autopsies and the skulls displayed during the trial, causing Miss Borden to faint in the courtroom. The murder weapon was never found and no one else was ever charged with the crimes. Lizzie and her sister became very rich with their inheritances, but socially isolated. 
The Ferris wheel was invented by Pittsburgh bridge builder George Washington Gale Ferris and debuted at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893 where shredded wheat also premiered to the public. The fair also called the World's Columbian Exhibition to celebrate Columbus's discovery of the New World attracted 27 million visitors during the five months it was open. 150,000 of these visitors, including suffragists like Anthony, Stanton, and Stone, attended the week-long World's Congress of Representative Women at the fair, where almost 500 women from 27 countries gave speeches on women's perspectives. Ida B. Wells, along with other African-American leaders, called for a boycott of the Chicago World's Fair because the organizers blocked black participation and negatively portrayed the black community. I'll talk more about Wells at the end of this video. After the astronomical economic growth and expansion of the Gilded Age in America, the 1870s and the 1880s, the U.S. experienced its worst recession before the Great Depression of the 20th century. The Panic of 1893 set off an economic crisis that lasted until 1897. It's called the Panic because there were runs on banks, 600 of which closed when they were unable to pay their depositors. Over 15,000 businesses shuttered their doors and 74 railroads failed. Severe unemployment and ensued almost 20% nationwide at the recession's peak and much higher in locations economically dependent on major employers that went bankrupt, like railroads. Soup kitchens proliferated as homelessness, starvation, and desperation were exacerbated among the poor and the newly impoverished. There was no welfare system to help anyone. As far as what caused the 1893 panic, there are innumerable factors and no absolute consensus among economists and historians. So I'll briefly discuss a few of the possibilities. One is the railroad bubble, somewhat like the housing bubble that led to the 2008 recession. If you've been watching HBO Max's The Gilded Age, you know railroads were a big deal in the 1880s. In fact, they dominated working class life throughout the late 19th century in America as the major employment sector. There was little regulation under the Republican government. So wealthy men became wealthier through railroad speculation, buying railroad stock and building rail lines, more than doubling the length to over 175,000 miles by 1893. They were overbuilt, meaning supply far exceeded demand, at the expense of massive debt, and often just to prevent another company from laying lines in an area first, like claiming territory. To some extent, if rail lines were built, people would buy tickets, but not enough of them. The Philadelphia and Reading Railroad Company, one of the nation's largest employers, tanked in February 1893, shocking investors and the public. By the end of 1893, one quarter of all rail lines went bankrupt or into receivership. Some historians blame the 1890 Sherman Silver Purchase Act for the panic. This act required the US government to buy 4.5 million ounces of silver monthly at market prices using treasury notes and silver coins that could be redeemed for gold from the U.S. Treasury. Silver production skyrocketed and its price on the open market plummeted, but the U.S. Treasury still had to pay out gold when people redeemed those silver notes, at least until the minimum amount of gold was left. When the notes could no longer be exchanged for gold from the Treasury, confidence in the American economy, stocks, and businesses nosedived and people ran to banks to pull out as much money as they could before it was too late. President Grover Cleveland oversaw the repeal of the Sherman Act, but it did little to help middle and working class Americans. Many Americans at the time, and historians today, blame the Democratic president for the crisis because he was unable to successfully mitigate the catastrophe in a timely manner, even though the major causes were in place and the panic began before he even took office in March. This was in part due to relatively limited central government oversight of the economy at the time. Maybe he did suck, but his predecessor, Republican President Benjamin Harrison, was equally to blame. After losing his bid for re-election in late 1892, the lame duck Harrison administration spent the intervening months vengefully setting the stage for the panic through newspaper and other media propaganda, telling Americans the Democrats would run the economy into the ground by getting rid of tariffs, which benefited big businesses, and those benefits would no longer trickle down to working people. You know, because trickle-down economics always works out for everyone. <laughs> 
Mm. In the Chicago Tribune, the administration stated, the working classes of the country need a lesson. It remains for the wise man to endeavor so as to arrange his personal affairs that he will suffer least from the threatened affliction. In other words, y'all voted in the Dems, so you are to blame for what follows. President Cleveland ended up having to borrow 65 million in gold from JP Morgan, the Wall Street banker. How did he have so much money to lend? The Dems lost the midterm elections and did not regain control of any branch of the federal government until 1910. So Harrison's plan worked and the working classes disproportionately suffered. But the wealthy could go to Hawaii and buy up land. The island chain of Hawaii was not yet a part of the United States, but crucial steps in that direction took place in the 1890s when the US essentially took over and stole a sovereign nation for economic and militaristic gain. The king of Hawaii, David Kalakwal, died in January 1891 and his sister, Liliuokalani, became queen regent soon after. Queen Lydia Liliuokalani was the first queen regent of the island nation, which had a constitutional monarchy modeled after the British. She was the last ruling monarch of Hawaii and a remarkable woman, and I'll link a few in-depth videos on her life in the description below. Queen Liliuokalani fought hard to revoke the bayonet constitution her brother had been forced to sign that severely limited the monarchy and disenfranchised Native Hawaiians by preventing them from voting unless they owned land, which most of them did not. Wealthy American, English, and other white businessmen had bought up 90% or more of the land and were using it for sugar, pineapple, and other plantations. These sugar barons were strongly against giving up any of their power, and after almost six months of political arguments in Hawaii's legislature, Marines and sailors from the US Boston marched through Honolulu with a cannon and innumerable guns in January of 1893, intimidating Liliuokalani's supporters and deposing her, after which a provisional government took over the island chain. This government was headed by plantation owner Sanford B. Dole, whose cousin later started the Dole Food Company. The deposed queen Liliuokalani relinquished her throne not to Dole's government, but to the United States in the hope that the U.S. would restore Hawaii's sovereignty to her and her people. She wrote a letter of protest to Harrison, but it was President Cleveland who responded months later. He agreed that her overthrow was illegal and he authorized an offer to reinstate her if she granted amnesty to those who perpetuated the coup. Lily Okalani insisted they receive the death penalty as usurpers and Cleveland handed this issue over to Congress, which in 1894 found everyone but the Queen guiltless, allowing the provisional government to form the Republic of Hawaii and crown Dole as President of Hawaii. An 1895 rebellion to reinstate Queen Liukalani resulted in her arrest and imprisonment after rifles were found in her Washington Place home. She was under house arrest for months, and rather than allow six of her jailed supporters to be hanged, she signed a document officially abdicating the throne. In 1898, she wrote in her memoir, Hawaii's Story by Hawaii's Queen, For myself, I would have chosen death rather than to have signed it. But it was represented to me that by signing this paper, all the persons who had been arrested, all my people now in trouble by reason of their love and loyalty towards me, would be immediately released. Think of my position, sick, alone woman in prison, scarcely knowing who was my friend or who listened to my words only to betray me without legal advice or friendly counsel, and the stream of blood ready to flow unless it was stayed by my pen. Lily Ukulani stitched a quilt and composed music during her eight-month imprisonment. She was a talented musician and wrote Hawaii's national anthem and Aloha Oi in earlier decades. The Republic of Hawaii gave her a full pardon and restored her civil rights in 1896 when she traveled to Washington DC to convince Cleveland to reinstate her. She worked tirelessly to regain Hawaii's sovereignty and, with the grassroots support of her people, protest the push for annexation of Hawaii by the United States. An annexation treaty was defeated in the Senate in 1897, but due to Hawaii's strategic position in the Pacific Ocean, the nation was annexed anyway in 1898 under the New Lands Resolution after the outbreak of the Spanish-American War. The United States continued its imperialistic ventures by taking over Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines from Spain, the latter resulting in the Philippine-American War. American imperialists like Indiana U.S. Senator Albert Beveridge tried to justify annexation with like the following. 
Americans altruistically went to war with Spain to liberate Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and Filipinos from the tyrannical yoke. If they lingered on too long in the Philippines, it was to protect the Filipinos from European predators waiting in the wings for an American withdrawal and to tutor them in American-style democracy. Altruistically went to war? <laughs> <laughs> William Jennings Bryan, Andrew Carnegie, Ernest Crosby, and many others founded the American Anti-Imperialist League in 1898 to oppose annexation of the Philippines. Member Mark Twain wrote of the Philippine conflict, I have tried hard and yet I cannot for the life of me comprehend how we got into that mess. Perhaps we could not have avoided it. Perhaps it was inevitable that we should come to be fighting the natives of those islands. But I cannot understand it and have never been able to get at the bottom of the origin of our antagonism to the natives. I thought we should act as their protector, not try to get them under our heel. We were to relieve them from Spanish tyranny to enable them to set up a government of their own. And we were to stand by and see that it got a fair trial. It was not to be a government according to our ideas, but a government that represented the feeling of the majority of the Filipinos, a government according to Filipino ideas. That would have been a worthy mission for the United States. But now, why, we have got into a mess, a quagmire, from which each fresh step renders the difficulty of extrication immensely greater. The Philippines finally gained independence from the U.S. in 1946 through the Treaty of Manila. Hawaii never did and became a state in 1959. But at least Americans could still buy a Coke. Coca-Cola was first sold in bottles, called Hutchinson's in 1894 in Pittsburgh, Mississippi, beginning America's addiction to portable bottled sugary soda, pops or colas or whatever you call them, and the beverage bottling industry's contribution to our solid waste problems. Please recycle. And Americans could run or start running. Some Americans, anyway. The first Boston Marathon occurred on April 19th, 1897, on Patriots Day, a regional holiday celebrating the start of the Revolutionary War in the US. 15 men began the race, then 24 and a half miles, and 10 men finished. Women were not allowed to officially join the race until 1972. The first escalator was installed as a novelty ride at Coney Island, New York City, in 1896. Speaking of women, I'm going to focus on an important heroine of civil rights, Ida B. Wells, in my final segment of this video. Wells was a skilled journalist, researcher, teacher, and activist in the civil and women's rights movements. In the 1890s, she launched a fierce anti-lynching campaign following the 1892 murders of her friend, Thomas Henry Moss Sr., and two of his business associates at the hands of a white mob in Memphis, Tennessee. Moss was a successful grocery store owner, and Wells was godmother to one of his daughters. She wrote and published columns and articles exposing the racist causes of lynching in the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight, a paper she co-owned with James L. Fleming, and her writing was picked up by black owned papers across the country. Dear Miss Wells, thank you for your faithful paper on the lynch abomination now generally practiced against colored people in the South. There has been no word equal to it in convincing power. I have spoken, but my word is feeble in comparison. Brave woman. I was writing angered local rights who responded with violence. They burned down the building housing well as printing press and offices, forced Fleming to flee and threatened Ida, who was vacationing in New York at the time, with bodily harm. Never returned to Memphis and stayed with friends in New York before moving to Chicago. October 1892, Wells published her pamphlet, Southern Horrors, Lynch Law and All Its Phases, detailing the white brutality manifest in the racial violence of lynching to make Northerners aware of these murders in the Southern states or to rid them of their inaccurate assumption that black men deserved such extra judicial punishment for raping white women. Thomas Henry Moss had only been guilty of running a burgeoning business across the street from a less successful white-owned grocery. Countless other black victims of lynching had not been accused of any crime, much less convicted of one, and were murdered for things like having a reputation, unpopularity, frightening a child by shooting rabbits, 
were for no discernible reason at all. Wells accurately portrayed lynching of successful black people like Moss as a means of suppressing potential black economic competitors. As she wrote, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. White abolitionists in Britain invited Wells to speak on lynching in the UK based on Frederick Douglass's recommendation and because of her pamphlet, articles, and public speeches. Ida went on two speaking tours in the UK in 1893 and in 1894, and during the second, she wrote for the Daily Interocean back in the States, becoming the first black American woman to be a paid correspondent for a white newspaper. Her tours spurred the formation of the London Anti-Lynching Committee, the first organization of its kind. She also got a lot of negative press in the States, with many personal attacks attempting to discredit her. In the year Frederick Douglass passed away, Wells upped the ante and brought all of her investigative research and writing skills to bear in her 100-page 1895 publication, The Red Record, Tabulated Statistics and Alleged Causes of Lynching in the United States, 1892 to 1894. This pamphlet would have far-reaching impacts on the debate about lynching and uncover the lies that lynching was reserved for black criminals, that it only happened during race riots, and that it was necessary to defend the chastity of white women. She included 14 pages of statistics on lynching, all data from articles by white journalists and white newspapers, and she described accounts of lynching in graphic detail. Her statistical analysis revealed the alarming increase in lynch mob violence in the South following emancipation, with 225 black people murdered by lynching in 1892 alone. It also exposed rape as an excuse for the real reason for lynching, white supremacy, a way to enforce second-class status on black people now they were no longer enslaved. Between 1899 and 1929, an average of one black person was lynched every four days in the U.S. And Wells eventually decided reason and logic were not working and advocated armed resistance. Wells became Mrs. Wells Barnett in 1895 and remained active in the women's rights movement despite being ostracized by U.S. suffrage organizations for openly questioning white women for ignoring lynching. She was engaged in truth-telling that we now understand internalized racism made it difficult for white people to hear, and she understood the double whammy of prejudice based on sex and race faced by black women, what Kimberly Crenshaw would later call intersectionality. Along with civil rights activists like Mary Church Terrell and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Wells founded the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs in 1896 to address issues dealing with civil rights and women's suffrage. It is the oldest remaining black organization and is still active today. Ida B. Wells lived a lifetime of combating prejudice and violence and stands out to me as a positive force in the 1890s. She said what needed to be said, an inspiration in her own time and for anti-racists today. This video is not exhaustive, but please let me know what you think in the comments below. What other important figures were active in the 1890s in the U.S. and elsewhere? What other important historical events happened in the U.S. and around the globe? Thank you for watching and please like, comment, and subscribe.